Well, Carl Truesdale, welcome to the podcast. You are a facial plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive. For those of the those of us who don't know your kind of path out of fellowship, give us the nitty gritty and tell us about your practice as it is today. Sure. So um, I, I feel like you hit the the big the big stuff. So I'm a yeah fellowship trained double board certified facial plastic surgeon like yourself. Uh, I work in Beverly Hills and I run my solo practice, which is True Self Facial Plastic Surgery. And I also have a separate practice where I partner uh, with Dr. Dr. Uh, John Drummond, uh, Rob Drummond, and we do hair transplants and that's Crown Hair Institute. So my practice currently is pretty much 95% uh, cosmetic. I do very little reconstruction at this point, pretty much just through my foundation. Uh, and my path to this point basically started when I moved to LA. I did my fellowship at the Lasky Clinic. And during my fellowship, which is an extra year of additional training after completing five years of surgical residency, um, you basically get the opportunity to start seeing your own patients and doing some of your own procedures after all of these years of training. And so for me, initially, I started putting out ads on Instagram um, and Facebook for Botox and fillers. And patients came in because the price was right. Um, you know, Beverly Hills is one of the most competitive places to do what we do in the world. And so you can't really go too far <laughs> without finding someone who offers those things. But the compelling thing that I had at the time was I'm a doctor. And I was just willing to basically do it almost for free. I mean, there was still a cost, but I really wasn't trying to make money. I was trying to just get a portfolio and get my name out there. And so Botox and fillers, um, slowly those prices increased. And some of those patients were interested in surgical procedures. So I was able to start doing surgical procedures and my portfolio grew. People were able to kind of see what I did. Um, so by the time I'd finished fellowship, I was very, very busy surgically. Um, and I proven, I guess, proof of concept that I could make it in Beverly Hills. And so my wife and I just decided we're going to stick around in a big pond and try to become a big fish. And, um, we loved LA. So the opportunity opened to build out an office. And so we built it out. We took the big jump and built out an office. At this point now, I have a current, my current office is about 2,300 square feet. I'm on Rodeo Drive. I've got seven employees and I'm in the process of building out a second office um, downstairs in my building, another 2,300 square feet, which with my own private operating room and uh, office space for uh, hair transplants. So that's kind of where I am right now. And things are good. Business is busy and I'm able to take care of a lot of people and, um, you know, spread some joy out there in the world. That is incredible. I mean, to already be opening your second office. I mean, congrats. Thank and you. some of your outcomes are really incredible. I have to say that this weekend I saw your story on a necklift that you were doing and I I'm good friends with some other folks in our, our world where, you know, for those of you who don't know, I'm also a facial plastic surgeon and, um, you did a weekend lift on a patient and I want to know like exactly what maneuvers you did on her. If you're willing to share sure. because her neck intraoperatively looked phenomenal. And she was, she was a challenging anatomic neck to start yes. with. I would say hundred percent. I had to put the extra work in for that one. You know, so um, I don't know what your audience is like, but I'll give you the nitty, nitty gritty. I've done a few things that have changed, you know, over time, med medicine is a practice. And so you get better over time. And some things that recently I've done, which have changed the paradigm of how I approach the neck is really thinking of the two different facial and neck planes. And so when I'm in the neck and then when I'm in the submentum, I really need to know and see that the anatomy is what I want it to look like. So Dr. Nyack talked a lot about, you know, not having anything going beyond the plane of the neck or the mandible. That's super, super key. So I do a lot more submental work now than I used to. 
meaning I'm taking out, um, you know, any kind of fat, lymph nodes, glands, anything that's under the platysma muscle. So it all, it all has to go. If I'm not looking in and seeing the edge of the bone and that there's something in a recess, then I know I've messed up. So, uh, you know, technically what I'm doing is uh, I'm preserving at least, you know, a decent layer of fat under the skin. So sometimes I remove some fat under the skin with lipo. In her case, I did, but I don't over, um, over lipo. I free the skin from the platysma mm -hmm. and I don't do as much skin undermining as what a lot of people talk about classically. I then mobilize the platysma and I'm mobilizing the platysma all the way to the level of really kind of like level four, like where the edge of SEM is. I'm going all the way out from the midline. I'm then taking out um, the fat layer and the sub submentum. I preserve a lot more midline than I do laterally, but I'm taking out that level, you know, level 1A, 2B, 2A, all of that's kind of coming out. Um, and a lot of times I'm taking out the submandibular gland. And so uh, that's where the, the nuance and the trick, because that's really challenging to do through the submental incision. So um, I'm taking out those glands very often, almost, you know, 90 to 100% of the glands on both sides of the neck. Then laterally, when I'm lifting, I'm making sure I also freely mobilize the platysma. I'm creating a nice shelf. So you really want to etch out the ramus. And when you do that, when you're making, when you're scoring the SMAS, you get extra length above the mandible and below the mandible. And so it's almost that bridge between like a platysmal hammock slash, um, uh, mastery crevasse technique. So it's kind of incorporating mm -hmm. both of those kind of things where splitting the mandible out almost to the level of the, where the gland would otherwise be, that preserves the architecture along the ramus, but it gives me extra platysma to work with and smas to work with. And then I am dissecting a little bit of the parotid off of the mastoid, and that's where I'm securing my, uh, my flap. And so it's a really hearty lift even if you were, even if you leave glands in, you're able to really get a lot of retro and superior displacement of the neck contents. So with those things, I mean, it's been a game changer. My necks are so much cleaner. Um, a couple of the things that I do with the skin. So instead of splitting the, and I know this might be too technical for your podcast, but basically, no, that's okay. I, if, if it's I'll, too much detail for somebody, they can skip through this part. <laughs> These are the nitty gritty details that us surgeons want. Yeah. So, you know, basically the plane of where I'm mobilizing the, uh, the skin, retro displacing the skin, it's a lot more like what NIAC does. So rather than always tracing out in the retro, um, the, like the, the retro auricular area, I'm actually splitting at a tangent to where I want the skin to go. And that's the point so that there's no arc of rotation up and around the ear, less necrosis, less flap irregularity, and more skin that you're able to actually, without tension, remove. And so those are some of the basic little overarching things that I'm doing with my neck that's has changed the game. Um, the necks are ridiculous. I wish I could do my own neck lift, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and okay, so two things. So he's referring to Dr. Mike Nyack, who's in St. Louis, who's been such a phenomenal teacher to us surgeons, both the seasoned surgeons and us younger surgeons. Um, if you don't know Dr. Nyack, go check him out as well. Um, and then what's interesting, Carl, I, so when I trained in fellowship, you know, we did not do aggressive deep neck work, but as a young surgeon, I really pushed myself to learn and adopt some of these newer techniques that some of these other surgeons are teaching. I would imagine it was somewhat similar to you, you know, the first few years out in practice, you're doing a little bit more different maneuvers than what you did in training. Tell us how, how you gauge, like, what do you adopt? What do you try? Or when do you stay conservative and do kind of as your maybe fellowship director did? I think of what we do as we're, we're artists, right? And so whether or not you play an instrument or you're a portrait artist, whatever your medium is, you're bringing your own little flair onto things. And so when I see a technique and it looks like it makes sense, I will try it because my foundation, the strong um, training that I had in my background, I feel comfortable 
basically in all the anatomies. So if, if it's the anatomy, I understand it. If it's technical aspects, I'll try to learn as much as I can before I bring it to a patient. But, you know, I've never been one who's been afraid to try something. Um, there are things where you know it works and that's all you need to know. It works and the solution is not worth, you know, trying something new, then you stick with it. Um, so I've always been, you know, able to kind of push, push myself, but having a really strong background in head and neck cancer surgery, some of the stuff that we did at University of Michigan really put me at ease with a lot of these things that I'm doing. So God forbid, you know, you're, re you're, by you're back by the retromandibular vein and you cause some bleeding when you're doing submandibular gland excision. Well, you know, I've taken a bunch of those out. I understand and I'm, I've am i operated in the parapharyngeal space. I've, I've operated, in, you know, so it, it, from a safety perspective, it has to come first. But there is a lot of on-the-job training. I'm bringing my own, I'm hearing this note and this phrase, and I'm making my own jazz. And so I think that's the the beauty about what, we, what we're able to do is we get to figure it out as we go and create what we like. So I might steal a little inspiration from Jacono. I might steal some from Nyack. I might steal some from Tele. I might steal some from someone in Turkey and just put it all together as my own thing. And that's that's kind of what I've been able to do. But you're right. A lot of what I'm doing was not necessarily done in my fellowship. Um, a little bit was done with one of the head and neck cancer surgeons at University of Michigan, Dr. Spector. A little bit was done with my fellowship uh, director, Dr. Frankel. All of it comes together, um, if, that, if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you mentioned that what we do is such an art. Um, I also know that you're a portrait artist and a pianist. Tell us a little bit about um, why you chose facial plastic surgery. I would imagine that you are a little bit um, drawn towards the arts in terms of music and drawing. And how do you think those things have helped you become a better surgeon, a clinician, maybe even a better boss or a better dad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say um, immensely. <laughs> So why I chose facial plastics is 100% the artistry and you're, you're chasing your canvas and our canvas happens to be the human face and the human form. And I've been drawing faces and doing portrait work literally my entire life. I actually have my portfolio right over there because I'm working on a, a drawing of my son right now. But um, what I would say is when you're an artist and you don't know anything about head and neck anatomy or facial anatomy, you're learning, you're subconsciously, you're taking in ratios, what looks good? What do people's faces look like? I've been thinking about this literally for 20 years drawing faces. And so at the time you're becoming a better artist because you're learning about ratios and facial harmony and balance. Then you become a medical student and a student of medicine, and then you actually know the anatomy. You can then take that back to your art and make better, better portraits. And so you know, I just picked up a, a, my graphite and my charcoal the other day. I'm doing a portrait of my son. And I'm like, whoa, I'm better than the last time I did this. And it's been a year and a half. And that's crazy. So, you know, I think they reinforce each other. Nuance, subtlety, detail-oriented, balance, harmony, shapes, light, depth. All of that is what we do. All we're doing is bending light around structures. And so, um, you know, to create a beautiful nose, you really be you really need to be able to draw it out and, you know, in your mind, have a vision and then try to, you know, create that. And so the small little nuance feedback, I'm moving the tissue one millimeter this way or maybe this way, and this is the way it's going to settle. You're bringing all of that, you know, kind of experience of, how you know things heal with what it looks like right here, where, where you want it to go and you're kind of letting it go out. So, you know, a patient asked me the other day, why, why are your results look so different than others? Why does your, <laughs> and I think it's all those micro little decisions and things that we do that make the overall outcome beautiful. And that's where the art comes into place. You, if you ask a world renowned artist, why is your art amazing? And maybe someone else doesn't, you know, see, you know, that th that art is amazing. Doesn't mean that it's not, it could be, but it's all those little micro decisions and micro things that you're bringing in 
What paintbrush am I using? Well, I spent 10 years trying to figure out what paintbrush to use. For me, I've used hundreds of different scissors. And so I know the scissor that I need for a specific task. Those are all the little micro details um, that come into play as I've seen it. <laughs> Not only are you fine tuning your surgical, you know, um, techniques as you gain more experience, your practice is growing. You mentioned that you have seven employees and you're building out a second office with a surgery center. Give us some insight into, you know, are you doing that all yourself? Do you have a consultant that's helping you? You know, how are you juggling the day-to-day -day tasks of being a surgeon, a clinician, a boss, a general contractor, overseer, Right. You know, how, for those that are maybe in fellowship or in residency and are looking to do what yeah. you've done, what advice would you give them in, in doing it all? So the first thing is you can't do everything, um, but you should have a foundation and a knowledge of everything that you otherwise would want to delegate. So um I, you and I have spoken about this before, you know, you might bring a consultant on, they're not going to try or have as much passion about your business as you. And so it behooves you to learn as much as you can. It's constant learning. When I first started my practice, which I started with my wife, so she's a huge, huge, big piece of this, which I'll get to in a second. Um, you know, we had a consultant who helped us you know, um, kind of think through things or, but it just really, they were bringing less ideas than what we had. And it, the execution wasn't nearly what we were doing. And so we very quickly got out of that. My wife, um, uh, she recently stopped working at Deloitte Consulting, but she was a senior manager working in mergers and acquisition practice. So high level business lady. And so uh, that definitely helped me. I've known I've wanted to do this for a very long time. So I put myself in a position to learn business, marketing, you know, PR, all little aspects, not saying that I'm, you know, I have an MBA, I don't, but I have an on the job MBA. And so when I was in um, residency early years, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I started learning about finance and, uh, I don't, you know, a balance sheet and, you know, what, what's the ROI of certain things that you can try. And so sharpening myself constantly, and that's one piece, great time management organization, uh, knowing where you're going to get the 80% from the 20% um, is really important. Having great people around you to fill in where you, you have a lack of expertise or trying to figure out the things that you don't know that you don't know you don't know. Um, all of those things are what I'm saying. Otherwise, it's you know, it's it's a day by day thing. I'm figuring it out as I go. Um, can't say that I have all the answers, but things have things have done you know been uh, working out. I think writing down your goals and then for each thing on that list, figuring out an actionable plan to get there. And um, there's a guy who I listen to on YouTube, Alex Harmozy the entrepreneur business guy a lot of times if you re if you uh, reverse engineer the problem so as human beings we think of things you can think of the solution but we're much better at figuring out the problem <laughs> so if i tell you lauren tell me five ways that you can ruin your marriage you probably can come up with those it's really quickly because we want to run away from um problems it's just you know, animals. Uh, but if you reverse each one of those things, well, how can, how would I, how, how would my business fail or how would I go bankrupt immediately? Well, X, 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 Y, Z, A, B, C, D. Let's do the opposite of all those. And so um, thinking in the revert, having a really well executed plan and thinking through them, getting uh, feedback where you've hit a wall or if you've tried certain things, looking at what other people have done and seeing what works well and what doesn't work well, what will work for you. Those are all the things that I've been doing. Oh, are we frozen? Yeah, I think there are a lot of similarities between me and you both starting our own practice. Oh, are we there? 
Yep. We're there. Um, a lot of similarities in terms of just doing it ourselves, And I think, you know, I don't, I don't really want to learn from other people's wheel in some instances. I want to reinvent the wheel. And I think that's probably what's contributed a lot to your success in a very competitive area is that you do things slightly different, mm-hmm. um, especially with your marketing. You know, you can definitely feel when you follow you on Instagram that it's, you know, you're heavily involved in your own marketing. It's not necessarily like a marketing firm. It does It feels very organic and real. And I would imagine that your patients gravitate towards your personality and they feel very comfortable by the time that they trust you to undergo surgery. Yeah. By the time the goal is Um, by the time they come into the office, they already kind of know me. It's just a confirmatory thing. And so um, when you walk in, you should kind of know that I'm passionate about what I do. You should kind of know that I'm good at what I do. Uh, The staff should reinforce all those things. So when you come in, you've kind of heard of this before a little bit. You kind of know what you might need because I've already reviewed your photos. I've already seen what you look like. I already can, I've given you an idea of what might benefit you. Now that could change when I see you in the office, but you know, you already kind of have a sense of what you're even going to spend. And so the goal is when you come into the office, when you're here, you're ready to book a, a date to, to go for surgery. And so Yeah, I think uh, social media has been fantastic. Honestly, without social media, my practice would not be where it is. Um, And you're right. You're seeing me because I'm making some of those videos on my phone. (laughs) And so it it is 100 percent organic. One thing I want to ask you is, okay, so in my world, I feel like being a female and being just very different than the average facial plastic surgeon out there has really contributed a lot to my success. What things either demographically with you or the way that your practice runs, like besides the marketing component, what about you and what you do has really led to growing so well in your first few years on your own? Um, well, I would say in the beginning, the big thing was this is a very well-trained surgeon who, you know, has a very high pedigree and who's very, very good, who's at a great price. In the beginning, that's kind of where it started. And so it being in Beverly Hills, you can throw a, a rock and hit a cosmetic surgeon or yeah, ophthalmologist or plastic surgeon in any direction. You close your eyes, you just throw a random stone, you probably hit one. And so when I first came out here, that really, you know, added to my success because I was basically saying, listen, I will do your surgery. I'll pretty much like, you know, I'll do it for, for almost free. I just want to show you how good you are going to look and just give me the opportunity. And so very quickly though, that changed in terms of, you know, definitely not, the the lowest, uh, the cheapest or the most expensive. But that was one thing that helped me differentiate. After that, you know, in terms of demographic, you know, I'm a black facial plastic surgeon. There are not many black facial plastic surgeons. And so I have one of the most diverse practices in plastic surgery, full stop. White, Asian, black, Latino, uh, Persian, Middle Eastern. I have people coming in from all over the world. And some of it is because I've been, I've made myself an expert in, you know, having a culturally a sensitive aesthetic um, and expertise in certain things. And so if you look at my Instagram page, you're going to see white people. You're going to see black people. You're going to see Asian people. You're going to see Latinos. Um, and so I think that that's one thing that's really helped me. Um uh, the other thing is I speak fluent Spanish. And so being in Los Angeles, there's a large Latino population. And so coming in and being able to have a consult uh, in Spanish where I'm talking about your facial concerns, that definitely helps. Uh, that's something about me. Um, and, you know, there are there are other little things, that are reasons why people get drawn in. Maybe they saw a video of me you know, dancing with with my son and, you know, you're just a really good father. That's really great. You know, I can tell you're a good person or maybe it's the pedigree. Hey, you're double board certified. You're Ivy League trained. You've got all these publications. I don't know, um, but I try to be authentic. And uh, I think it's definitely translated 
But, um, you know, I would be, it'd be foolish for me to say that, you know, being a black facial plastic surgeon, the black population seeing what I do, you know, that's been key. Uh, it's been super key. Yeah, that's great. Another similarity between us has been um, my spouse was also heavily involved in helping me get started. He has a very strong business background. There are times when we tend to disagree. Um, but, you know, what are some what are some learning points that you and your wife had in starting the practice? What are some things that you guys either did right that were really right? Or what were some things that maybe you guys would have done differently now with hindsight? I think in the beginning, so for the first six months of the practice, my wife was on sabbatical, which was amazing. And so literally, I started this practice. If you would have called me in 2021 or 2020, it would have been me answering the phone, me ordering the supplies, maybe greeting you out in the parking structure, bringing you in collecting payment, writing the note, doing the procedure, all me. When she came on board, it really helped, you know, put systems into place. And so, you know, the the idea is a lot of the good thoughts about business are already out there. Fortune 500 companies, business, they make a science of good business. And so you can reference these things. Um, employee handbooks, uh, standard of, you know, what is the, what is, how should you organize your script, your telephone script? All these things can be figured out. And so I think she brought those things in, which was really, really uh, helpful. Um, things that we could have done better in the beginning really was we we spent so much time on, uh, you know, certain vendor, vendors or people who we had expectations for that they didn't meet it. Um, you know, we had to make our website five times. We went through countless marketers, countless people who, hey, we can do this and that for you. We really needed to do the hard learning of failure uh, with some of these people so we could figure out, hey, listen, we actually can do this or we need to find someone who's not like this. So what was it, you know, how did we make this mistake when we chose this person to run our marketing? And let's never do that again. And so um, we try to not make the same mistake more than once. Uh, so, you know, we, we have uh, frequent um, check-ins. We have team meetings. We have meetings between her and I. Um, we're goal-oriented. And so that's been very helpful. I would say the thing overall in the practice where things could have been better is definitely bringing in people who don't have as much value as you would love them to have. And so figuring that out early and letting letting go problems early is super, super key um, because if you're not, then you're just wasting money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all of that. Um, I have definitely made my hand, um, plenty of mistakes, yeah. Um, let's talk about briefly Nurse Jess. How did yeah. you find her? What kind of, what role does she have in your practice? What goals do you two have for 2024 with the practice? So nurse Jess found me. She slid into my DMs. Uh, hey, are you hiring? <laughs> and this was before I, um, before I even uh, opened my office doors. And so I told her, no, not yet, but, you know, eventually, you know, check back in with me. Uh, I remembered her. And so when it came time and the practice had matured, matured enough to the point where I wanted a physician extender, I reached out to her as well as others who had done the same. And she was a great fit. Um, her aesthetic and my aesthetic match, she was a go-getter. Um, and right now, so she does, she's here in the office right now, seeing patients. Um, so basically all minimally and minimally and non-invasive treatments she takes care of. Patients can see me for those things, but they have to pay a little bit of a premium. So Botox, fillers, chemical peels, certain lasers, Morpheus 8, uh, body and face, um, semaglutide uh, injections. She basically takes care of that. Um, she will send in prescriptions for me. We work together in social media. Um, 
For 2024, our goals are to make her even busier. So she's already busy. She's already doing well, but to get her busier. To And we've finished a, an injection course, which we're going to drop here in the next uh, month and a half or so. So uh, she and I, over the last probably four, four to six months, have been working on an injection course, an online injection course, uh, with videos ranging from everything, Botox and fillers, if you want to learn how to inject and some of the behind the scenes, how we set up our vials, how we, uh, you know, all of the little pearls, all the things that I wish I would have known. Uh, we have made this in a very digestible video series with live demonstration and injection. So we're we're going to launch that in a few few months. I want to get her teaching this year. Um, so at a conference um, um, and then in terms of other things. In the practice, we'll be launching a um, a YouTube uh, TV series, uh, like a TV show, and so she'll be a part of that as well. And so, staying busy, staying active, but Nurse Jess is a great um, great contributor to the team. And for those that are interested in the course, how will that be available, or where can they access it? It'll be available online. Uh, stay tuned with details. Uh, we'll put out a drop. Uh, I, honestly, so we're in the editing phase right now. So uh, mm -hmm. hopefully in the next month and a half, you'll have access to that. But uh, it'll it'll be on my uh, link tree on Instagram. It'll be on Nurse Jess's. And it literally is every single thing that, not every single thing that I know, but pretty much every single thing that I could think of to remember in the moment of how to inject every area of the face safely um, and aesthetically, um, at least according to me and Nurse Jess. And so um, a little bit of background on marketing as well, um, facial analysis, pertinent anatomy, injection techniques, cannula, non-cannula, uh, different filler, um, basically every single injection technique you can think of is in that course. So it's gonna be pretty, it's gonna be pretty live. That's incredible. Yeah. What an amazing resource to learn from a facial plastic surgeon. Cause a lot, of, a lot of, um, a lot of folks out there just don't have quite the in-depth anatomical knowledge that, um, you know, you bring to the table. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Truesdale. We are going to wrap up. Um, is there any, any parting wisdom to those out there that are looking to grow their practice? Maybe just one little pearl you have in terms of the social media presence that you have and, and any, any little thing you could offer the audience. So the first thing I would say is don't skimp on social media. Social media is super, super key. Um, you know, recently in the last three to four months, I've gone super, super viral and gained a hundred and 40,000 followers on Instagram. And that is from just consistently posting, putting out good, good results, capturing the patient journey, videos over static imagery. So we can tell a story, be authentic and pump out the content. You have to put in energy, you have to put the effort in, um, you know, and you never know when the algorithm is just going to pop off. And so if you're consistently um, posting, you'll figure out, you'll get better. Um, don't offload it to someone else. Do it in-house. Um, get good. Download uh, CapCut. Download Fixer. Put it together yourself. You will get faster. And just start uploading things. Figure out what your audience wants to see. And uh, you will get patience from it. Um, I would probably do multiple different outlets from TikTok to Instagram to YouTube. Uh, all of that will help. I mean, honestly, uh, because of how much I've grown in the last three to four months, I've turned off all of my paid ads. Basically, the only things I have boosted right now are um, like a semaglutide stuff and stuff for Nurse Jess and my hair loss business. I'm no longer paying for Google ads. I'm no longer paying for Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, and that's because uh, I've been able to create such momentum from organically with just my presence that literally people are just calling in for treatments. And um, and so I don't know, uh, I don't know if that's replicable for every single person, but the the basis of that is still there. And so um, social media is still super important. 
uh, in our business. And so focus in on that. All right. Beverly Hills facial plastic surgeon, Dr. Carl Truesdale with nurse Jess. We, um, can look forward to his and hers injection technique course that'll be available online. Beautiful.